Okay, so uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, so we're very lucky to have Percy Leong. Um, you're probably uh, already familiar with some of his work. He's a, um, a professor at um, Stanford University in the Computer Science Department, um, one of the people really um, pushing forward the boundaries of AI, um, finding the best of deep learning with the best of um, knowledge representation and reasoning and using it all to um, better understand language. So um, he'll be talking about trade-offs between robustness and accuracy. <coughs> I'll hand it over to Percy. All right. Thanks, Roger, for the introduction. I'm really happy to be here virtually um, and hope everyone can hear me. It's a little bit weird since it's my first time actually giving a, a virtual presentation. Um, so this talk is going to be about robustness and accuracy. I'm going to get to what these terms mean in a second, but I want to start with some bad news. Um, the bad news, um, you might have heard it, is that machine learning is not robust today. So whatever robustness means, uh, we don't have it. And there are two examples of this I'll illustrate quickly. One is probably familiar to many of you, adversarial examples. Um, you can take images, apply imperceptible perturbations, um, and still cause state of our models to fail catastrophically. Um, it's pretty dramatic. So uh, on CIFAR 10, for example, if you just train a standard ResNet um, to state of our accuracy 95%, um, and you apply adversarial evaluate on adversarial examples, you get a uh, very high accuracy of 0%, literally 0%. Um, less dramatic, but perhaps more uh, pernicious is the issue of spurious correlations. So in this task, um, this is out of uh, uh, Chris Ray's group, um, they were looking at uh, classifying chest x-rays as whether they had a collapsed lung or not. And so they trained off um, standard uh, state of art computer vision models uh, on this. And uh, the model did you know, reasonably well. Um, but the issue is that if you look over here at the image, um, you see this little tube that's coming out. So that's a chest drain. And it's a common treatment for collapsed lungs. And it turns out that the model was latching onto this correlation that showed that, well, if you've been treated for collapsed lungs, then you probably have collapsed lungs. Um, so thanks, model. That was probably not very helpful. And in fact, all the patients who hadn't been treated yet, these are the people, this is a subpopulation of people who probably need this model the most and were not able to deliver. So if you look at the empirical results, people who have chest strains are all ROQC curve. Indeed, um, the model performs really well on them, but the people without chest strains, uh, the model is much less well. So subpopulation of untreated patients are worse off. Clearly very bad if you're just um, looking at uh, the standard accuracy metrics. So the general robustness problem is, can be characterized as the train distribution is not equal to the test distribution. If they're equal, we have decades of learning theory and methodologies developed, and we kind of know how to um, deal with that case. Um, but when they're different, uh, we have to do something. So then just to set the stage a little bit to kind of lay out the landscape, um, there's kind of two notions of robustness. Um, first is kind of stems from this rich literature dating from the 50s on robust statistics. This is more about when there's noise in your data or when there's outliers. Um, I, I think of this as when the training data is, distribution is hard because it has um, these uh, 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 outlier points. But the test the distribution if you're doing prediction is normal. Um, if you flip this, this is kind of more spiritually uh, related to the work on robust optimization, which also goes back at least 50 years from operations research, where here are the training distributions, you get normal data, but at test time, you're expected to work on at least different, if not harder data, which could be adversarial or, or it could be extremely noisy. So diving, so this talk is going to be within robust optimization, but kind of diving in a little bit, we're going to be talking about distributionally robust optimization, which um, is talking about not perturbation of individual points, but of um, distributions. Um, so adversarial examples is a case where the test distribution is still the same as the train distribution, but where each individual point could be, can be perturbed a little bit. Um, we're also going to look at another class of um, 
robust uh, distribution shifts, which uh, I'm going to call minority groups, where this test distribution is a subpopulation of a training distribution. And in a, for example, in the chest train example, the top population might be the set of people who haven't had a chest train, but nonetheless still have a collapsed lung. And more generally, there's this whole rich literature on domain adaptation, which deals with more general shifts, um, but we'll concern ourselves with these two um, adversary examples and minority shifts for this talk. If you have any questions, um, you know, feel free to interrupt and ask. And Okay, so I'm just gonna check back here just to make sure I'm connected um, because I, otherwise I might be talking to myself for a very long time. Okay, so let's say we care about, for now, robust accuracy. And to be clear, robust test accuracy, either on adversary examples or binary groups. Okay, so there's a kind of very natural follow your nose strategy, which is to optimize the robust training accuracy because, well, you only have the training data. And this corresponds to uh, things like adversarial training from the adversarial examples literature and so on. Um, but the main problem here is that it actually hurts the standard accuracy. So here's an example on CIFAR. Remember we had standard training 95 and zero. And if you do adversarial training, um, then which basically means um, train on the artificially generated our adversary examples at training time in hopes that you'll work better on uh, test our adversary examples. So robust accuracy does go up a fair amount, uh, non-trivially, but notice that the standard accuracy drops, drops by, um, you know, doubles, more than doubles. And you, you have other met methods which uh, have the same kind of uh, trade-off. So this is, a little bit uh, disappointing, right? Because um, you would have expected that if you'd robustify your model, then you'll just be better and you ship that instead. But you can't, you wouldn't really want to ship this model if it's going to have um, more than double the error rate, um, especially if you're deploying in settings which are not adversarial. So what's going on here? This talk is going to try to elucidate some of that. Um, when and why does this trade-off happen? How do we mitigate this trade-off? And how does this trade-off interact with model complexity and the amount of data? Okay, so are there any questions before I move on to the first part of the talk? <clears throat> okay, so the first part is going to be about work uh, done with uh, my students, uh, D.T. Raghunathan, um, Michael Xie, postdoc Fanny Yang, who is now at ETH, and John Ducci uh, in, in Stanford Stats. Okay, so here's the setup, um, some notation and terminology. So standard accuracy, uh, you're looking at the fraction of examples with respect to a training distribution that you're getting right, a particular model F, um, classifying input X and the, where the true label is Y. Robust accuracy is you're going to look at the fraction of examples where um, you are getting right over all perturbations. Um, sorry, this is a little bit confusing. It's not average over all perturbations. It's average over points where for every point you consider all of its perturbations. So a typical example in adversarial examples literature is Elvinity perturbations where every image can be perturbed by at most epsilon. <clears throat> So this is test time. These are evaluation metrics, standard accuracy, robust accuracy. <clears throat> so at training time, we're gonna consider for now two different types of uh, methods. Um, standard training is just optimize the standard training accuracy. Um, and robust training is trying to optimize the robust training accuracy with something like adversarial training. Um, there's some optimization issues here, which I'm not going to dwell on for now. Okay, so one thing that you might be interested in is the robust, uh, the standard accuracy of the robust train model, or you might be interested in the robust accuracy of the standard train model. So there's a kind of a two by two matrix that you should think about in your head. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we saw earlier that on CIFAR that robust training seems to hurt standard accuracy. So why does this happen? Well, there's a number of good reasons why this might happen. First, it, 
is that there just might not be any function that has good standard and robust accuracy. So this has been explored in the literature. Um, and this is just kind of a fundamental limitation of your setup. Um, but on the other hand, in these applications, maybe that's not really the case because at least humans, which are some function, um, you can pretend it's a humans or some function, do have good standard accuracy and good robust accuracy. It could also be the thing that a function like humans exists, but your model family isn't expressive enough um, because we're using neural networks uh, that which aren't humans. Um, maybe that's the problem. Um, in which case there is a trade-off as well. Um, but these days, neural networks are so big and over-parameterized, they essentially fit all your training data pretty much perfectly. Um, so maybe this is um, a less of a concern. Um, could be that the robust accuracy is just harder to optimize. This is definitely possibly true. In fact, if you're doing average robust optimization, even computing a single gradient is actually um, you know, intractable and you have to resort to kind of some heuristics like um, um, PGD. But we're not gonna talk about this in this talk. Um, it could also be the case that robust or adversarial training just has worse generalization. Um, and that's gonna be the focus of this. So just looking at a kind of a example on CIFAR again, this is some evidence that shows that gener generalization is really the thing, is an important thing at play here. So as the number of examples grows, you see that the gap between the standard and the adversarial training diminishes with more data. So we didn't have infinite data, but you could imagine that with more and more data, um, this gap actually just you know, goes away, which really means that it's a kind of a finite sample complexity issue and not really having to do with fundamental um, structural issues with the problem itself. Okay, so at this stage, we really wanted to understand this better. So we thought, well, could we come up with the simplest example where we could get this trade off and see through the microscope like what and understand what's going on? Okay, so we tried to, you know, we tried a bunch of examples, but one surprising thing is that we were actually able to get something much simpler than we thought to exhibit this trade-off. <clears throat> and I think this really distills down a core issue um, behind generalization and robustness that I'm gonna talk about. So roughly, even if the model is well-specified and convex, so there's no optimization use issues, no issues of can you even approximate the model, um, we still get this trade-off. So here's a, a visual of uh, what we're doing here. So imagine doing regression using cubic splines. So this, imagine you're doing 1D regression. So um, this is the covariate T and you're trying to fit this function. The true function F star looks like this. So it's kind of a staircase which looks uh, uh, globally linear, but locally it has this kind of step shape to it. And the black dots are the points at which you're getting samples from where the magnitude of the point is um, roughly the, uh, the concentration or the, uh, the probability mass on that point. Okay, so if you do the standard, um, so I should say also the, the standard distribution that you're uh, looking at is just the points on the line. So if you get these purple points, then you're just able to fit this line and um, you can predict accurately on the points out here. Um, but you know, locally, you're going to mess up a little bit on these uh, these kinks in the staircase. Um, so it's it's not certainly not F star, but you know, it's it's fine. Um, so now you can say, okay, well, let's get these kinks in there. Let's add these extra points. So x x is going to be these extra points. I'm going to give the model more information and tell you, look, there's these kinks. Go fit them. And now. What happens is pretty interesting. The model um, does this, which is actually much worse because yes, it did go, go fit in these kinks, but out here, it's just completely predicting the wrong thing. Okay. So this is an important kind of <clears throat> um, visual to have in your head. So you might be thinking that you're doing good by adding these extra points, which are correct. Remember, we're in a well-specified setting. So there exists F star, it's in your family, it's a cubic spline that can get all these points correct. 
So you're adding just true information that the model is capable of fitting. And there's no optimization issues of splines. This is basically linear regression in some basis. So you're able to fit everything. And yet still, we're getting this pretty bad behavior. So conceptually, you can think about it as what happened was that this extra data kind of um, distracted the model. And that the model is going to go fit some local structure now. And this comes at the expense of this global structure. OK. Any questions about that before I move on? <clears throat> OK, so um, I'll even make this example even simpler. So this is the simplest example we could come up with, which illustrates this. And it's so simple that I think we can do everything in closed form. OK, so you have, suppose you just have one training example. So the training example instance, three dimensions, you're doing regression. So 0, 0, 1, and the response is 5. And if you did the standard estimator, you would just fit 0, 0, 5. Okay, you fit the data perfectly, you're done. So now I come along and say, you have this extra training data, and um, I'm going, it's the extra data is 1, 1, 0, and the output is 4. Okay, now you have to fit both of these points in the augmented estimator, which you can think about as robust training. Is, um, is going to fit this point as usual with this five. And on these first two coordinates, there's multiple things I can do. I can do one, three, I can do two, two, I can do zero, four. Um, but one thing that is a ch what I'm, we're gonna be studying is min norm um, predictors, which means that it's gonna choose whichever theta that minimizes the, the norm, which happens to be spreading out your weights evenly, two, two. OK, so fine. And now suppose that the population covariance is uh, this matrix, which has a 1 and a big variance in the second coordinate and a 1. So th this is the covariance of your test data that you're getting. And the test error is, can be written as uh, in this form. So those of you who are familiar with like, linear regression will find this familiar. Um, and another way to think about this is it's measuring the distance between theta and theta star, um, but just in a different norm, which uh, is uh, turns basically parameter error into prediction error. Okay, so now look what happens. So suppose that the true theta star was three one five. Okay, so now the if you look at the standard error, um, sorry, sorry, the the theta standard. So the standard estimator has error one thousand nine. So you pay. Uh, three squared for the first component, um, and you pay a thousand for the second component, and then five you got right, so you don't pay. Um, and the augmented estimator is actually has higher error because on the first component um, we're now paying a um, one squared, two minus three is one, and but on the second uh, component where um, Sorry, did I? Maybe this I, I screwed something up here with the math. Um, augmented estimator should have. Uh, I think I messed up the numbers, but um, maybe the the augmented estimator should have a higher error. I think I switched something around here. Um, and so the idea here is that adding even valid data um, can result in higher error. So let me try to illustrate this pictorially. So we have, um, I'm looking at the space in two dimensions. So remember, this is a three-dimensional problem. The third dimension um, is kind of fit perfectly, so we're going to leave it aside. So on the first two components, the standard estimator is 0 because it didn't see any data in that space. So min norm would just drive it to 0. Theta starts here. And when I add this point, basically what I'm saying is that I'm only allowed to choose um, Theta is that have the same projection onto this line as theta star. So I'm restricted to this, this line here. Um, and I'm going to choose the min norm, which is going to be this point here. OK, so notice that this is uh, helpful in that it moved me closer to theta star if I'm just looking at Euclidean distance. But remember, the test error is should be measured in terms of the population covariance. And if the population covariance, remember that um, the errors in E2 are going to be 
um, treated much more severely than errors in E1. And so um, this actually moves me on the whole closer, but in E2, it's actually farther. So which is why um, the augmented estimator can actually be worse than standard, even though I'm adding this valid data, which brings me in Euclidean distance closer to theta star. Okay, so um, there's some, we have a more general characterization, um, which characterizes conditions, sufficient conditions for which the augmented estimator, which is uh, trained on more data, is uh, no worse than the standard estimator. So when the population covariance is identity, then the nor norms match and you're good. If the augmented data spans entire space, then you're also fine. And this becomes true if you have more and more data. And also this kind of uh, weird fact, if you have one data point, you're adding one data point, it happens to be eigenvector of theta or of the population co covariance, you're fine as well. Um, I should point out that these results hold more generally for data, general data augmentation, um, not just for the splines or um, sort of adversarial perturbations. Okay, so how do we fix this, right? So we can't control the population covariance or our training data. So what can we do? So the key insight is here is that this trade-off really comes between, come, stems from the mismatch between uh, the norm that we're measuring at training time. So remember, we're doing min norms. So we're trying to make theta small and then the test norm, uh, sigma, okay? Um, so if we had sigma, maybe we can just measure things in a different way at training time and change our estimator. Um, and the key, the, the key idea here is that sigma is just the expectation of XX transpose, which can be estimated from unlabeled data. So uh, here's the, this visual here again. Um, so we're calling our method uh, robust self-training. And the idea here is that there's a new objective. Instead of just minimizing the norm of theta, we're minimizing this kind of thing that actually looks like kind of like the test error, except for we've uh, plugged in uh, theta standard instead of theta star, um, which can also be written as this, which can be interpreted as you want to um, choose theta which agrees with your standard model as much as possible. Okay, so geometrically what this looks like is, um, so you're still restricted to this line because of the interpolation constraints. So this line you're still, um, but because you're putting the sigma here, you're going to basically say, hey, why don't you choose out of all possible consistent theta, something that fits your um, data much better. And because E2 has such strong weight, it's going to push, uh, you down here to this point, which is actually going to be um, have at least as good a um, standard error as this uh, standard estimator. Okay, so here's the kind of a general uh, algorithm, which we call robust self-training. Um, this was actually introduced in our NeurIPS paper from uh, last year, motivated by using a different method, but then we study this trade-off and we came about actually landing on the same algorithm uh, again from a different angle. Um, so you have some uh, training data, you do standard training that gives you a classifier which is uh, reasonably accurate on the standard distribution. Um, and now you do go to an unlabeled data and you pseudo label that data. Um, and then you put all that data together and you do robust self, uh, robust training and you get something that's hopefully robust and accurate. So we have a theorem that says in the noiseless linear regression case, if you do this procedure, you actually get the best of both worlds. You get something that has um, at least as good standard error as a standard estimator and at least as good robust error as a robust, uh, as an augmented estimator. So that's kind of the best you can um, you know, hope for and given the assumptions we made. Um, so this is, um, let me not go through this. Uh, this is just gives you the, uh, the pieces of the objective function of the robust objective. Basically it um, matches, tries to, um, I guess I'm going through it now. So it 
matches your label data. It, it uh, tries to match the pseudo labels, but this is, um, this is not a hard constraint. It's a soft constraint that you're, you know, remember you're minimizing. Um, and then we also enforce invariances uh, that uh, the different transformations, um, the model doesn't change predictions uh, under the different transformations. So while this is uh, motivated and derived and proved for linear regression, um, the general principle can be applied to arbitrary functions. So let's go back to the splines example. So remember, here's our true function. And the standard estimator fits this line that captures global structure. This augmented thing uh, tries to capture, um, gets micromanaged into capturing this local structure and then flops out, out here. And with uh, RST, robust self-training, what we first do is we fit standard estimator and then we pseudo label these points up here. And that's gonna clamp us up here. And now we can go and fit all these uh, little, um, little ridges. And then we actually get kind of the best of uh, both worlds. So fit the global structure first and then the local structure. Okay, and we also ran this on CIFAR. Um, so our method over here um, actually significantly outperforms um, previous methods, um, both on robust and standard accuracy. So note that uh, in a way we're, we're using one extra thing that we're using is we're using extra unlabeled data. So of course, this is not exactly a fair comparison, um, but um, common folk wisdom is unlabeled data is uh, cheap. Um, and if you, you might also be wondering about like normal self-training, Normal self-training doesn't work at all for robust accuracy. Okay, so let's discuss a little bit. So the first message is that um, some of these issues around data and accuracy and robustness are actually kind of uh, surprising, at least to us. And it's important to be aware that even if you add valid data in the most favorable circumstances, it can hurt your standard accuracy sometimes. Um, and the root problem here, as we've identified by deep diving into this uh, linear regression, is the inductive bi bias is just suboptimal, right? So there's, you know, we think of neural nets as being, you know, expressive and it can fit anything. But really, I think the problem and the, a lot of these subtleties come from the fact that it's not really about that capacity at all, but it's really about the inductive bias from training and from the model architecture. In this case, we study min-norm, and that showed us a particular way in which the inductive bias, if it were bad, could really hurt you. Um, and we show that unlabeled data seems like a promising route to uh, improving robustness. And I'll point out that you know, this idea of self-training is as old as you know, the existence of unlabeled data, um, but it's always been a little bit you know, sometimes it kind of seems like a good idea and sometimes it helps, but often it doesn't. And in the normal setting, I think the results are more mixed, but I think that in the robustness setting, these fairly classic ideas can be brought to bear with kind of more fruit uh, than before. Um, and finally, I should point out there's some work from uh, Quark's group, which is quite impressive showing how uh, you can use adversary training to actually improve standard accuracy using data augmentation, um, they have slightly kind of, they don't have as much of a trade-off because they use a, a weaker adversary. So their goals are different because they're trying to just uh, use, not get, they're not really interested in uh, robustness against a strong adversary. But some of the ideas about robust self-training are actually very similar there. Okay, okay any so questions? A question for the audience. Um, so how do your conclusions change if there is noise in the data? Um, labeling by the data standard makes sense when there's no noise. Um, but what is the um, standard model? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so what happens if there's noise in the data? So our analysis, as stated, um, doesn't handle noise because you're interpolating. Um, we did try to analyze a noisy setting. You can think about what we're doing here as in the setting of noise, it's just um, uh, looking at the bias. Um, and then there's a variance with noise, there's another variance term, which gets things get a little bit more complicated even for linear regression. Um, and depending on the amount of noise, 
uh, it can kind of go either way. So we don't have crisp uh, results in the thick high noisy case. One other thing to point out is if you really have noise, um, there's been some studies, uh, Fanny was looking at this, where um, you actually really don't want to be doing interpolation. Uh, interpolation with the noise can actually be a very bad idea, which means that, well, we should probably be analyzing a different estimator anyway with noise. So that's an open question that uh, we'll, someone should look at. Are there any other questions? I think we're good. OK, I'll go on for now. OK, so we looked at adversary example. So let's turn to spurious correlations now. Um, so this is joint work with uh, my students, um, Shuri, um, uh, Aditi, Panwei, and a postdoc, Tatsu, um, who's going to join as a faculty at Stanford um, uh, in the fall. Uh, so remember, the motivation here was that chest strain example where uh, models can latch onto spurious correlations. I'm going to show a few other examples where this uh, is pretty pervasive. So here's an example data set that we constructed just to um, be illustrative. Um, so here the task is predict whether image of a bird is either a land bird or a water bird. So this is the duck. And um, normally bird, water birds are kind of over water and land birds are over land. Um, so what happens is that these models can latch onto background as spurious correlation. And then when you put a duck on land, it, um, it predicts this is a land bird instead of a water bird. OK, so this is um, clearly bad. Here's another example. Here the task is to predict uh, a person's hair color. And it turns out that gender is actually correlated with hair color um, for a number of reasons, which I won't get into. Um, and uh, so an ML model who is trying to predict hair color might latch onto gender and um, therefore certain types of uh, people like blonde males in particular, which are actually in this data set only 1%. So they're very, blonde males are very rare, uh, it turns out. Um, those people actually are, um, are, don't do as well because uh, um, the gender fee spurious correlation doesn't help predict accurately there. Here's another data set on uh, natural language inference from NLP. The goal is you're given two sentences and you're asked to predict essentially whether the two sentences contradict each other. And uh, the way that this data set was gathered, and there's been a lot of discussion in NLP about uh, these data set artifacts, um, is that Turkers are asked to basically uh, write a hypothesis which has a certain relation, and often people just put in like the word no. So it happens that the word, the mere presence of a word no is very correlated with um, contradiction. Whereas clearly, if you look at this sentence, there was silence for a moment. There was a short period of time where no one spoke. The word no appears, and this is not a contradiction. Um, so the general setup can be summarized in this two by two matrix. So this is a set of all our examples. There's four groups here. On the, the columns here correspond to the different labels. Uh, y equals water bird, Y equals land bird. The rows correspond to the different spurious attributes, which um, are what kind of background it is, either water background or land background. Um, so the majority of the points lie on the diagonal, where the background is correlated with the, the label. And the minority of the points are on the off diagonals, where they're not correlated. Okay. So if you just train uh, a model business as usual, just throw all these points into a um, you know, ResNet, then, you know, you do pretty well. You get 3% error. But if you look closer at the breakdown of errors, you see quite a different story. So the off diagonal uh, definitely does, oh, sorry, the diagonal does pretty well. Uh, but the off diagonal is actually pretty bad. 40% um, error for this poor duck who is stuck uh, stranded on land here. OK, so what do we do about this? Um, so here, the notion of robust accuracy, I'm going to start calling worst group accuracy. And standard accuracy is average accuracy. So 
There's been a lot of interest in the, uh, this idea of distribution and robust optimization. So John Ducci worked on this about, again, this kind of comes from operations research, but in, it's made its way more and more into kind of machine learning um, literature. Um, so remember the standard uh, way of doing empirical risk minimization, just man minimizing average error, will cause the majority groups to do well, but then minority groups to fail, therefore resulting in a large worst group error. Um, and what distribution robust optimization does, um, and I should say that distribution robust optimization is a very broad framework. We're going to be talking about very specific instantiation, which is where we're only looking at essentially the, the maximum uh, average loss over groups. Um, so here, if we set this objective, then you would hope that um, you push down on the maximum um, square loss and you would end up with a low worst group error as well. Um, but it turns out that doesn't happen. And the reason why this doesn't happen is again, goes back to generalization. So here, this is a very nice simple picture where there's average and worst group, but really there's train and test. And what happens at training time is that the models that we train in using default settings, they just, mem they just memorize the training data perfectly and get zero training loss. And uh, then we see this test error, which was plotted on the previous slide for ERM. The test error is a lot worse for the worst group. And so now if, uh, remember, we only see the training set. So now if you try to apply group uh, DRO, then it's going to try to push down on the worst case group. But if the training loss is already zero, there's nothing to do. So it returns essentially the same thing. Okay, so if you have zero training error, you shouldn't expect any sort of distribution of robust optimization to work because the max and the sum of zero is zero. So it might be worth kind of taking a brief interlude here um, and why we're even talking about this problem. So the reason we ended up here is uh, we were kind of just doing what was um, common. And these days, it's very fashionable to train huge over-parameterized models until the zero training error, um, until zero training error. So you see a lot of papers showing how if you, <clears throat> um, if you train in, uh, either longer or introduce more um, hidden units, more parameters, then the error just keeps on going down and down. Um, just as a side note, there's this phenomenon called double descent, which some of you might have heard about, which has uh, gotten a lot of interest where the, the error actually dips down a little bit and then goes up. So the classical regime is like, it looks like you should be here, but actually if you made your model bigger and bigger, it would actually just get a lot better. Okay, so this is kind of the, the fulcrum of this is what we should be doing. And this is what we did. But in the case of, if we care about worst group error and want to use DRL, this isn't gonna fly for the reasons stated on the previous slide. Okay, so what do you do about this? Well, the obvious thing to do is kind of go back to the classics and do good old fashioned complexity control. So there's many things we can do here, regularization, early stopping, reducing the number of parameters, and effectively they all work um, to the extent that what happens now is that regularization just keeps the train test gap small. That's what regularization you know, does. And um, so if you did ERM plus a regularization, this actually doesn't help because while the gap between train and test are small for, um, for everyone, um, the test, the training error is also very really large for the worst group here with ERM because you're not pushing down on the worst group. So this isn't helpful. Um, but if you do group DRO plus complexity control, then it turns out to mitigate the problem uh, by a lot. So again, to summarize, regularization keeps the train gap, train test gap small, and then DRL will push down on the worst group train, which you know by I guess transitivity or something will keep the uh, worst group test, which is the thing you care about, uh, small as well. Okay, any questions about that so far? Okay, so just to explore this a little bit, um, we looked at the effect of 
um, reducing, increasing or reducing the number of uh, parameters in the network for uh, Salabi and Waterbirds. So this is not regularization, but this is another form of complexity modulation. And we see here that as you increase the model size, um, the average train goes down, the worst group train goes down, the average test goes down, and the only thing that goes up is the worst group uh, test you know, accuracy, or error, rather. And in Waterbirds, it's uh, actually a little bit more interesting, but the kind of the same idea that um, three of the curves go down, but the one that doesn't is the worst group test, which gets hurt because the train gap, train test gap increases. Therefore, DRL doesn't have uh, the pressure to, is not exerting pressure to push down on the worst group uh, test anymore. So here, this is actually kind of looks like a double descent where this point is actually pretty good. And this actually gets better, but it's still this point in contrast with um, average error is uh, higher than it was um, in some of these other papers. Okay, so why does this happen? Um, so this is a pretty complex phenomenon and we don't have a full story, but here's one story, um, one interpretation of what might be happening. Um, so, and I, I call it a story because I think there's, the situation is more complex than this, but I think this is illustrative. Um, and, and so we'll just go with this for now. So each input has a core and spurious features, right? So the core feature might be the, the foreground and the spurious might be the background. And learning using the spurious uh, features is, is hard, um, but it is, it is the thing that actually works for all groups, right? Look, looking at the foreground, like the duck, I mean, it looks like a bird. I mean, you need to um, do extra work to figure out that this is a water bird, whereas if you look at the background, it's just blue, so it's water. So, you know, the spurious features are a lot easier, but again, it only works for the majority groups. Okay, so then this is a kind of a, a game that you have to, this is kind of this trade-off that you have to work out, which is that um, what's happening here, we believe, is that ERM does the easy thing and uses the spurious features because it's interested in um, average error and the majority group just dominates the average error. So the easiest thing to do is just use the spurious features, push down their loss of the majority, and then, with the extra model capacity, it just memorizes the minority. Um, and of course, memorizing the minority doesn't help it actually generalize to the minority at that time. And what DRO does is that because it's paying special attention to the minority, the minority doesn't really look like um, a minority and it is kind of forced to use the core features um, and actually learns the right thing. Okay, so uh, we, proposed a toy model um, to um, try to ground out the story. Um, in the actual um, paper, we have um, a kind of a less toy model that empirically matches some of the curves, but in the interest of time, I'm just gonna give you the toy model which we can actually analyze and might be kind of easier to uh, see. So we have binary classification with a binary attribute. Um, so we have a core feature, which is centered around Y, so either a minus one or plus one, um, with some variance, uh, sigma is core squared. And we have the spurious attribute, which is centered around A, um, which is minus one plus one, and with some other um, variance, which is presumably smaller than core variance, because the spurious feature is supposed to be easier to fit. And then we add some extra noise uh, features and noise features um, with some, and these are meant to be features that uh, give the model capacity to memorize. So in total, the, there are um, two plus n features total. There's the core, the spirit feature, and all the noise features. And that is a single data point. And uh, we're trying to predict um, do classification on y which really only depends on this core feature. 
So here is a visual of what's happening. So I'm plotting this in two dimensions. So there's two plus n dimensions. All the other n dimensions are just uh, noise. Um, and I'm drawing the decision boundary here. Okay, so here's a chorus feature. Uh, there's a spurious feature. And um, I'm looking at two um, you know, possible uh, classifiers, let's say. So if you're using the spurious feature, um, and not the, the uh, you know, core feature. Um, this seems, this is kind of easy because um, it's easy to separate the majority blue from the majority orange here. And then all these other outlier points um, are, um, can be memorized by using the, the noise features, okay? So this actually has low norm. Um, and if you try to use a core feature to separate the blue and the orange, then it is the right thing to do um, because these minority points are on this side and these minority points are on this side, but you have a lot of noise. Remember the core feature has is noisy. So this uh, causes um, a lot of you know, errors, which has to be, um, digested by the noise features or just you know, incurred. So there's kind of this uh, dance between, you know, if the minority is small enough and the core feature is noisy enough, and there's some trade-offs which we make more precise in the paper, then um, it's gonna be cheaper for um, the model to use the spurious feature as opposed to the core feature. Okay, so one other thing I want to uh, just mention, which is kind of a side note, is that you know we have these majority groups and we have minority groups, right? And we could use DRO, um, which is actually a more um, you know principled way to deal with the situation. We can also uh, kind of heuristically uh, rebalance. So there's two strategies here. We can just downsample the points in the majority. So just throw away majority points until there's uh, as many majority points as minority points. Or we can upweight the points. So we'll leave all the points in the data set, but just give the minority points more weight. And so which is better? So you might be kind of tempted to think that upweighting is better because we're not throwing away data. We're just, you know, there's a lot of cases where, you know, from like raw black holization and sampling where you, you want to leave all the data and you can just m manipulate the weights. Um, but it turns out to be not the case. And this was, you know, kind of, again, surprising until you, you know, spent some, a little bit of time thinking about it. And the problem is that, remember, if you have zero training error, upweighting doesn't do anything, right? Just like DRO didn't do anything, upweighting is not going to do anything. Um, so upweighting is, doesn't solve any of your problems. Um, and what maybe is kind of uh, surprising is that downsampling um, actually works here. Um, and it makes the majority and minority balanced, uh, which means that the major minority is no longer a minority. And then you can see in these plots that the, as you, in that case, if you make the models um, bigger, then the minority actually enjoys this decrease as before. Okay, so um, there's kind of, it's interesting, there's kind of two ways to address the worst group minority uh, um, accuracy problem. You can either leave all the data as is um, and uh, apply regularization. So move this way and that, that works. Or you can throw away majority points um, and have whatever amount of uh, complexity you want. So I should still point out that, you know, up until now, we've been trying to get the worst group error low, and we've kind of succeeded um, to this level at least. But notice that if you look at the average error, um, the test error does suffer. Right, so as with adversary examples, um, the the standard accuracy drops 
in some sort of attempt to improve the robust or worst group accuracy. So ongoing work is we're trying to think about, is there something analogous you can do here to eliminate this trade-off, um, perhaps using unlabeled data, just like we were able to do with robust self-training. Um, so two points of discussion. Um, so bigger models, it is very fashionable these days to use bigger models. Um, but I think it requires some attention because bigger models can actually hurt minority groups, especially in these situations where you might not be measuring these errors and you have some hidden groups which are getting completely screwed over as you kind of as your average error is improving and improving. Right. So, um, so this is just a kind of a thing to be careful of, and um, a little bit of tongue in cheek. Um, you know, in in some sense, this this shouldn't be surprising, right? We we understand regularization, train and test um, need to be close for things to work. But the thing that happened recently is that we kind of ununderstood it. We, so there's, you know, rethinking generalization with this you know, paper from um, Google uh, two years ago that says, well, actually, look, we can actually have this wide gap in train test, and we're absolutely fine. But here it calls back, calls to, like, we maybe need to rethink rethinking generalization again. So there, I think in worst group settings, the generalization story is a lot more uh, complex. Um, and then finally, uh, I think there's still a lot of room left on the table here. So we accomplish our goals in this section by using le either less complex models, for example, regularization or dan sampling data. And these are extremely crude measures. These are kind of the first things you use to kind of stop a, um, stop a flood or something. Um, but I think there's still many opportunities to close the gap with uh, smaller, uh, sm sorry, sm smarter methods. Um, so final remarks here. Um, so robustness is a serious problem for real ML applications. ML is, I don't need to maybe harp on this, but ML is kind of taking over the world. It's used in all these applications um, that affect people's lives. And having things that work reliably, I think, is something that we shall take responsibility for. Um, one big takeaway here is that this robust accuracy does not always track standard accuracy. In many cases, it does. Like pre-training is something that actually helps standard accuracy a lot and also helps robust accuracy a lot. And so many of the ideas from just you know, business as usual focusing on standard accuracy will transfer over. But I think as this talk shows, that there's more to it than just that. I think there's special things that you need to pay attention to for robust accuracy and things where things can actually go in the opposite direction, like model complexity. Um, this work we um, was mostly about kind of experimentation and understanding the space and developing a few very simple targeted uh, you know, toy settings and analyzing them. And what's actually, Nice, I think, in a way, is that many of the, these core insights were, can be already revealed in the linear setting where things are um, kind of tractable and interpretable and transparent. Um, but of course, I think to really complete the picture, we need to develop better theoretical tools, you need to do probably more systematic empirical studies. And, and I think this is a really exciting area to be kind of studying this interplay between you know, optimization, the role of data, data augmentation, adversarial generated data, um, the importance of inductive bias, as we saw from the first section, and with all in to kind of understand you know, this generalization, which is in some ways a very old topic um, in theoretical machine learning. But it seems like I'm constantly surprised how little we truly understand it uh, these days. So with that, um, I'll thank my collaborators and funding Again, and thanks everyone for your attention and I'm happy to take uh, further questions. Okay, uh, let's give everyone just a couple more minutes to ask questions. So I can, uh, I can read the questions now. 
how would you approach scaling majority and minority groups and their permutations for and and their permutations and testing for DRO? Um, not sure I understand that exactly. Could you? Uh, this is a, from Red. Could you repeat that? You mean scaling up computationally? Oh, for natural language. Um, rebalancing at the start of training or as a fine tuning close to the end. I see. So, um, so a lot of, many of the experiments were, oh, wait, no, that's Sanju's question. Uh, this is very hard to track. Um, well, maybe I can answer uh, um, Sanjeev's question first. Uh, since so, rebalance measure as sorority of training or as fine tuning close to end. So, in our results, uh, you know, if you're using distribution robust optimization, you just you um, it's just kind of one optimization problem that you solve. There's no kind of tricks to start with majority first and then go to minority. Um, in practice, what happens, I didn't talk about the DRO algorithm at all, is main, essentially you maintain an adversarial distribution over groups, which gets kind of a rebalance according to the loss. And then you update your parameters with respect to that distribution. Um, and at the beginning, um, you know, everyone has high loss, so you're probably just like um, uh, updating on everyone. And as the majority uh, class gets fit, probably faster, then the minority class will start dominating the loss, and you'll start you know updating more on that as well. Um, maybe I can try to tackle this. This sort of similar to systematic generalization, natural language processing. Uh, so there's many types of domain generalization question settings. Um, I think the systematic generalization is certainly interesting where you're, um, you train on some set and then you're expected to extrapolate in a very structural way, maybe from short sentences to long sentences. Um, and that requires thinking a lot about the inductive bias of your models. Um, that I think is something we're also very interested in. The work here is uh, less kind of structural in that regard. And it's more, um, I mean, we do see inductive bias kind of showing up in the, the min norm um, solutions and how that impacts uh, in the case of linear regression. But uh, an analog of that in, um, uh, for discrete uh, settings and classification would be interesting as well. Okay, so let me go on. Remy asks, uh, any thoughts on going beyond predefined minority groups? Yeah, so this is a, a very important point. Um, we assume there were only two or four uh, groups which are predefined. We have ongoing work that is trying to relax that assumption. Um, in, in some ways, just to kind of paint the context, the traditional DRO is like uh, what we sometimes call joint DRO, which is um, you uh, think about all perturbations in all different directions on individual data points, which turns out to be far too conservative. Um, that's essentially asking for like, you basically should have 100% accuracy, which is unrealistic. So this group thing is kind of a response to that and saying, well, let's try to um, target particular types of generalizations that we want. And it's definitely worth going back and finding something in between, perhaps something learned. We did, we had a previous paper, which um, used clustering to identify groups. And then we uh, did DR on those groups. Um, Sanjeev says kind of like boosting. I think that was response to um, the previous question. Yes, yeah, so that's yes. Oh, I can click these as answered. Um, could you thoughts on, share some thoughts, how does this talk connect to online learning? Um, so the DRO algorithm that we use is actually an online learning algorithm where we have, it's a game between an adversarial that who's trying to play a distribution over groups and a uh, learner that's trying to, you know, learn as well. Um, so we actually, to get some guarantees on those, we draw from um, regret bounds and online learning. Um, what about the regression setting uh, distributions that are inflated at some point? 
points. Um, so the so the first part of the talk was mostly about regression, at least the theoretical analysis and the splines was about regression. The others were at, about classification. Um, I'm not sure what inflated at some points means. Any, uh, maybe a clarification or any other questions? There's some mass at some point, the group base setting example zero inflated. Um, example zero, inf you mean that there's an ex um, sorry, <laughs> I think uh, trying to answer questions on chat is kind of hard. Um, I'm not sure what example zero inflated means. Um, yeah, if we run out of time, I mean, feel free to uh, email me the questions or something if you want a uh, more detailed answer. I think we can wait just another minute. Okay. So is robust self-training slow? Um, so the slowness comes from having to uh, iterate over all the unlabeled examples, uh, but the actual um, update on each individual example is uh, relatively uh, fast. It's maybe like you know, small constant times the the normal. Um, uh, I guess in some ways, like if you're doing robust training, like adversarial training, it's already potentially pretty slow if you have an inner loop you're doing projected gradient descent. Um, so uh, that kind of dominates, that already makes you slow. Um, the self-training part doesn't really affect that. In fact, the, the loss function is more or less um, just apply robust um, loss to the unlabeled data. Okay, well, uh, thank you, Percy. Uh, very interesting talk. And uh, thank you to the audience for joining us. Okay, thanks everyone for listening.